Low River family, thank you so much for joining us again as we come together to worship, lift the name of Jesus high. Remember, no matter where you are, whatever you're doing, in state, out of state, in Abilene, somewhere else, we consider you part of our online church family. And if you have prayer needs, please let us know. Office at the riverabilene.com, office at the riverabilene.com, and we will be in prayer for you. A couple of things we want to let you know about. Uh, first of all, our, our reset is our final reset is this coming Wednesday, and it's going to be a night of worship, a night of firming up what God has done in our lives. But we're beginning by doing our Super Bowl, which is a competition with chili and soups. So we're going to eat chili. We're raising money for Pregnancy Resources of Abilene. So you vote with cash on which one you think is the best. Uh, there's a golden label that's at stake. It's going to be great. So six o'clock, we're starting that a little early, and then we'll 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 do our our night of worship after that. Should be an amazing, amazing night. If you haven't been in reset, it's fine. Come anyway. Then uh, don't forget that every first Sunday is our Team River class. So uh, not this Sunday, but next Sunday will be our Team River class. Immediately following the service, it's a, a time to explore whether or not you are called to partner. Um, with this church immediately following the service next Sunday. Also, this coming Thursday is our ladies' luncheon, 1130 at the Cotton Patch. Our ladies gather, they fellowship, they pray together. It is a great time of being uh, together. Also on February the 4th, the night of February the 4th, is a, a One Kingdom event of a citywide worship event. It is uh, called Exalt, and it's a time for all different expressions of Christianity, all different tr traditions to get together and, and to lift the name of Jesus high. It's going to be a great night where we reveal also opportunities for you to connect in and as the one church of Abilene begin to pray for your neighbors in Taylor County. So would love for you to be there at 6 o'clock at Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. Would love, love, love for you to be a part of that. Guess what? We're already talking about pre-registration for summer camp for the teens. Crazy, huh? Well, you can go to our website, theriverabilene.com, uh, and you can get more information about going ahead and registering your teen for camp. Or you can talk to our youth minister, Anthony Roselle. You can get his information online at theriverabilene.com. And don't forget that you can, at any point, participate in the life of the river and what God is doing here by giving. It doesn't matter where you are. You can give and, and be a part of the magnificent thing that God is doing here at the river. And there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to 539 U.S. Highway 83, Abilene, Texas 79602. You can give by secure text at 84321. Or you can give by going to our website, theriverabilene.com, theriverabilene.com. Go to the drop down and you can securely give there. We'd love for you to participate through giving the transformation that happens in you and the opportunity that that gift gives for us to be able to reach people and grow people up for Christ is amazing. All right, here's a question I would love for you to think about. This is according to 2021 research, so a couple of years old, not real old. So according to this new research, we make just sort of 29 really good friends throughout our lifetime. How many of those last for our entire lifetime? Out of 29, how many go the distance? Talk amongst yourselves. We'll see you in a sec.
We all follow a king. We all live in a kingdom. And for most of us, it's the kingdom of me. In this kingdom, we rule and reign. Reputation, success, power, comfort, and relationships sit on the throne of our hearts, influencing our actions and ruling our lives. In the kingdom of me, the outcome is always the same. Life is marked by foolishness and frustration. Failure follows failure, and relationships are broken as our selfish aims consume us. Until Jesus. Jesus announced the arrival of a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. Jesus marks the reign of a new king. This king does more than ruling from a throne. He rules in your very heart. But this king is different. 
As you follow this new king, he radically changes your heart, orienting you to life in his kingdom. Under his reign, selfishness gives way to generosity. Cries of self-reliance become cries of dependent prayer. Bitterness is replaced by forgiveness, and anxiety and fear evaporate in the light of the king's love and care. We have a new king. We have a new kingdom. The kingdom of God is replacing the kingdom of me. Logan River family, thank you for joining us uh, as we are continuing to talk about the concept of an inconvenient kingdom. Last week we talked about how Jesus would regularly, habitually sneak away to quiet, uninterruptible spaces to plead and worship, plead with God and worship God. What an amazing, inconvenient thing, but that God does amazing things when we engage in this inconvenience. So today we're going to talk a little bit differently. It's a little bit more rubber meets the road as far as human relationships. Well, let's talk about this. So if we make 29 sort of real friends through the course of our lives, how many go the distance? Well, according to a recent survey, about six go the distance. Uh, when we graduate high school, very quickly, we lose touch with at least 50% of our class. Human relationships for the long run. Human relationships for the long run. Have you ever thought about what causes you to back out of relationships or situations? You ever thought about that? You ever thought about what causes you to quit engaging certain people or certain groups? You ever thought about how uncomfortable and awkward it can be to be in a relationship, maybe even for a long time with somebody, but then there's change or there's drama or there's chaos? How inconvenient is it to respond to the Spirit of God to engage in relationship? Let's go to the Lord. Lord, uh, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits, strengthen our bodies for what we are called to do and to be, to participate in inconvenience so that we can truly be part of the kingdom. And as for me, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. And all the people said, Amen. I hope you said, Amen. So if you have a Bible, go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We'll be starting in verse 12. Let me tell you a little bit about what's kind of happened before and after that. Before this, uh, in the synagogue, a man with a shriveled hand uh, is approaching Jesus. Now, it's, it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do work or anything like that on the Sabbath. Jesus stands him up in front of the religious leaders who've got eyes on him, just trying to see if he's going to mess up because there's a crowd beginning to follow him. And, and he basically kind of turns the Sabbath upside down, saying God's movement on the Sabbath, doing good on the Sabbath, is, is, is a right thing. And the man's hand was completely healed. Big, big deal. Religious leaders, not in awe of the healing at all, really want to wreck Jesus' life. And then after this passage, we find that, that it's Luke's version of what we call the Beatitudes, the moment where he begins to, to teach a little bit about uh, a stair-stepping, deepening of our relationship with the Lord and how we're to interact with others. In, in between those events, we find this. So look in verse 12. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray. Now, let me just uh, lift that up. One of those days, once again, we've talked about this um, 
last week that, that Luke sometimes doesn't say. He, last week he just says in one of the villages, in one of the places, in one of these days. In other words, in proximity when he started talking about the Beatitudes, uh, whenever he did these healings, uh, that, that it's just somewhere in there. Luke's not worried about some exacting timeline that's irrelevant to him. Really should be irrelevant to us as well. But those who want to disprove or to uh, denigrate the scripture will point to something like this. It's not Luke's priority to give us an exact moment in time. He wants to tell you about what happened in the moment in time. One of these days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray. He spent the night praying to God. Now, here's what's interesting. The mountainside is super symbolic. Um, uh, Moses went to the mountainside. Um, uh, to, to talk with God, and it was a sense of God's presence. It's a sort of a going up to encounter God. Jesus has made a hike to a mountain to encounter God, and he's got something really pressing on him when he goes out to do this time of prayer. Same concept as last week. Uh, uh, it's the Greek word that, that says he's addressing the Lord. He's interacting with the Lord. He's, he's, he's listening to the Lord. He is, he is worshiping the Lord. Um, he is beseeching or crying out to the Lord. All those things are happening in this form of prayer while he's on the mountainside so that he is not interrupted. He went out to the mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God. We'll talk about that in a minute. When morning came, he called his disciples. Now I want you to know, there's not just 12 disciples. There's, there's some, that's something different. There's a group following him known as disciples. He called his disciples to him and he chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Big, big difference in what a disciple and an apostle is. Jesus has spent the night all night praying for revelation of this crowd, this group of people that are disciples, which one are called to be apostles. Two different concepts, very important selection going on. Verse 14, this is the listing. Simon, whom he named Peter, Petros means rock, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, you will see listings that feel different in the scriptures. Like, wait a minute, there's a couple of names that seem different. Another one of those, here's a way to attack the scripture. That That's not accurate. We have a different uh, name in 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 Matthew's account versus Luke's account and these other listing. Well, here's the deal. Um, everybody in this particular culture has more than one name. And so here's one reason that you would have some sort of disparity in that. Uh, people call me David. People call me Pastor David. People call me PD. People call me Pastor Diddy. People call me Hey You. Some people call me Reverend Skinner, same person, all different addresses at different junctures or different interactions in my life. Very similar in this culture, they're going to have people that have uh, more than one name. For, for example, Thomas was a twin. He was also known as Didymus, which means twin. So there, you're, you're having these listings that have some slight differences, but, but that's okay. It doesn't mean they're different people. It means that... Um, they have some different names attached to them. Now look in verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. So he had called them up to the mountain. He selected 12 and then they went back down together. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judah, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon. If you're looking at um, Jerusalem on the map, if you kind of go down and to the right, it's that whole region, which is over by the river. And then if you kind of make your way to the left, it's, uh, it's Tyre, which is over there by the, the lake, which means it's, it's, uh, um, 
it's one of those things where that entire southern region below Jerusalem is, is getting affected by the news of Jesus. He's a kind of a rock star right now. People are really following him. They're really hearing the stories. They're really wanting to be near him. And you're, you're about to see why. So they're from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Healed is therapeo. It means uh, uh, that those diseases leave. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Power was coming from him and healing them all. So we're going to look at, at two things. We're going to look at signs of the kingdom in this account, and then we're going to look at the inconvenience of participating in the kingdom in this particular instance. There's three places where I see quite clearly that the kingdom has shown up. We see in, 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 in Revelation 21 and other places, whenever Jesus shows up, the kingdom's showing up. There's these places where, where God does things that are not part of the natural order. There's something different, there's something upside down, something, you know, love, unlovely people being loved, people being healed. There's all these different things that begin to show up whenever the kingdom comes. And a lot of times it's in snapshots. It's, it's just a little bit of heaven touching earth. It's moments that all of us have maybe had an encounter with God, seen a miracle, participated in a moment of feeling God's presence profoundly. When we're like, oh, the kingdom of God was here. We felt that, that presence for a moment. Well, that's what's happened here. Three different ways. If you go down to those uh, uh, 18 and 19, you'll see that what's happening is the kingdom has shown up because there's healing. There is deliverance from impure spirits. And there's power. People are just touching him and they're getting healed. Now that's not normal. You know that's not normal. I know that's not normal. Just natural, supernatural he healings that, that just naturally, that, that, that happening, that's, that's not normal. That's not, that's not every day. That's not a, a thing that we just go, oh my goodness, we saw this miracle and that miracle and that transformation. That, this person got off of, of drugs. This person, we, we don't see that every day. It's just so much more profound than that. So beloved, we have a sign that because of Jesus' presence, the kingdom has touched the earth. Those who are broken and, and hurting and, 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 and demonized in this particular order of this life on this earth are now being transformed by the power of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. It's a, an amazing moment for that to be happening. I, I recently uh, read a story about a guy named Nico, a young guy, who was born with um, a disease where his body attacks his, his own platelets and slowly kills him. And, and at one point, there's multiple times when he's in the hospital and they're like, and you're not going to make it. You're, you're, you're not going to make it. There's, there's this multiple times. At one point, he wakes up and his entire bed is just covered in blood. It's just, his body is just not working. He goes to the hospital after a, a horrific time and at this point, he's a young adult, and they said, we need to keep you here. It's, you know, and he's, all his life, he's been told he's not going to make it. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And he just had this sense of faith, a sense of trust. And he went home, and then his blood count had come up. And then he went home again, his blood count had come back up a, a little bit again. And then he ends up on the L in this large city. He's on this elevated subway. And he gets a call and they say, we can't even explain it, but your blood count's not normal. And he knelt immediately right in the middle of that L and he praised God. The kingdom had come on an L in a major city. <laughs> That's not normal for a disease that he said was incurable. You have supernatural things happening. That's the kingdom. It's a picture of the kingdom. But not only that, there's something else going on here. Number two, there's a, 
an invitation for representation. There's a, a moment in the kingdom where there's this invitational to be represent, representational. You see, Jesus calls all the, that group up and, and then he picks 12. So he starts with disciples, which are learners, uh, followers, pupils. And he designates them as representatives, as apostles, those who are sent out, literally those who are ambassadors, delegates, people who will represent him, the Prince of Peace, part of the kingdom, rep represent him wherever they go. Whenever they show up, it is as if Jesus is showing up. That's their job. He picks 12 and draws them from learner to representational. That is the order of the kingdom. You've got to understand this. God doesn't just call us to follow, but to follow to the point that we grow to represent Christ wherever we go. He's just done that. These people, these 12, these 12 men have been elevated to represent Jesus. The more you grow, the more you'll be invited to represent. It's an elevation. The kingdom is not about staying in the same place. The kingdom is not about living in um, the flatlands of spiritual growth. You see, when the kingdom shows up, people are called out to represent, to become apostles, apostolos of Jesus Christ. It's a different thing. I, I will never forget as a 17-year-old boy, this church I was attending, uh, they had Sunday night church. I don't know if you grew up with Sunday night church. And on Sunday night church, they would, for, for, for about six or eight weeks, they were having just people from the congregation Bring, bring the message on Sunday night church. And they asked me, 17 year old. And I remember thinking, they asked me. Now I'm presenting and representational. I'm an ambassador, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. It was intimidating, but thrilling. When the kingdom comes, when there's a snapshot, when there's a moment, we're moved. We're moved into something greater. Thirdly, the, a picture of the kingdom, that just these natural things that happen when the kingdom shows up is the, uh, there was an invitation into transformation. It was invitational to transformational. So you see that Jesus invites them up. He chooses them. And then he takes them all down, the 12, all down to the flat place to heal, to provide deliverance, and to reveal power. You see, when the kingdom comes, we see miracles. We are called to be representational of Jesus Christ. And then we're called to participate in these amazing kingdom transformational things. Signs of the kingdom. Signs of the kingdom. He took those 12 guys, those rookies. They'd just been following for a little while. He said, now you're going to be the ones who share this. Now you're going to be the ones who do what I do. Come watch me. We're going to heal. We're going to deliver. The power of God is going to be displayed. That is the lifestyle you're going to be entering. That is a picture, a snapshot, the kingdom of heaven has touched earth. Doesn't mean this is happening 24 hours a day, every day. There's a moment. Here's a moment. Glorious moment. Healing. Invitational to representational. Invitational to transformational. That's the delight of being in the kingdom. 
the display of those things. Now, but, but where's the inconvenience? That sounds glorious. Where's the inconvenience? But look at the first verse. It says in verse 12, one of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. The night. You see, in Hebrew understanding, night was the minute the sun went down, not at 10 o'clock when you went to bed. That was night. Night was over when the sun was back up. Dusk to dawn. Jesus is crying out for wisdom. He's worshiping. He's asking for understanding. He's looking for names. And those names are being downloaded by God Almighty to him. But it took the night. Beloved, that's inconvenient. Starting the wheels turning in your kingdom participation by doing that for a night is absolutely inconvenient. I was a youth minister at a little church in a small West Texas town, and we'd kind of come to the conclusion, several pastors in the town, that we, we just had spiritual issues with our, with our kids. The, the students in that town were struggling so much. And so we decided, you know what? We don't, we don't even know what to do, but we do know we can do this. Let's pray. Let's do an all-night prayer vigil. It was interesting, me, the, the entire community was invited we hosted. Everybody said, yeah, we'll be a part of that. It was me and the senior pastor. Until about midnight. And Pastor Roy came in. I'll never forget this man. He had a couple of other people from his church. He came in at midnight. And that man beseeched God for two hours. With all of the, everything that he could have. It wasn't convenient. We lost a night's sleep. But we saw God do something amazing in the young people. Beloved, it's very difficult to dedicate copious amounts of extended prayer in our life. It's, it's just super, super inconvenient. But it's overwhelmingly fruitful whether we see it or not. Here's the funny thing, though. Let's talk about human nature. Not about you, but if I gave the Lord a night to seek out His wisdom, let's pray all night, Jesus. You give me your wisdom. Download it to me right now. I really just want to know who am I, who am I called to affect, who am I called to share with. I, I need to know this. Man, whenever I got that and I gave the Lord that much effort, you know what I'm expecting? that the road to stepping out into what God has called me to do would be easy. You with me? It's almost like a bargain. All right, Lord, you need to make this easy. Because you remember, I gave you a whole night. I prayed all night, Lord. So whenever you were calling me to involve myself in other people's lives, you should make that easy. You should make that just gloriously wonderful. There should be no chaos. There should be no drama. I don't know how you are. It's why we say those things like, why is this happening to me? I go to church. Why is this happening to me? I tithe. I can't believe this challenge. I pray a lot. It's why we say arguably immature things like that. Jesus spends the night in prayer. And you would think that the next day would be really easy. But look at what happens. He designates 12 men. You saw the list. 
12 men that he is now going to bring into his inner circle for anywhere for, from two to three and a half years. He's going to bring them in. They're going to do life together. They're going to travel together. They are going to tell stories together. They're going to sleep next to each other. They're going to go to the bathroom near each other. Twelve men who eat fish, vociferous vegetables, and flava beans. It's not going to be convenient. Off of a very inconvenient night, with no bargaining chip, Jesus is cast into an intimate interrelationality with 12 men. And who's on the team? Who's on the team? You got John, who seems to really love him and be near him all the time, but still won't really stand up for him toward the end. You got Judas, who's going to be the treasurer, who's going to steal money, and eventually be the cause, the catalyst for Jesus' crucifixion. You're going to have Peter. Peter's the guy that is occasionally wrong, but rarely in doubt. He's bold. He arguably has anger issues. But what about this one? You're going to have Simon the Zealot. That means he is a man who believes Rome should be destroyed, willing to hurt, cut, blow up, or assassinate anyone from Rome, walking alongside a man named Matthew who has sold his soul to Rome for the almighty shekel. And somehow, those two are going to have to get along. Jesus spends the night praying for wisdom, super inconvenient. Not only is he taking the night, he's spending the night seeking out God. He's not bargaining, saying, okay, now make this easy. He goes down and he chooses 12 people that he has to enter into life with. And they are not always going to be great to be with. They're going to be a challenge. Many occasions, they're going to be a challenge. You see, the kingdom, this beautiful picture of healing and invitational to, to representational and invitational to transformational, these beautiful pictures, this wonderful snapshot it all begins when somebody's willing to give a night's worth of prayer without bargaining with the Father to call people into a sustained relationship that will be ugly, messy, dramatic, chaotic, and violating. You see, the kingdom is very inconvenient. We tend to flow toward relationships that affirm us and relationships in which we find affinity. Somebody who makes us feel good. Somebody who sees things, has similar interests to us. I don't know that any of these people have the same interest of Jesus. And yet, they've just been called into his house. Beloved, the business of the kingdom is an invitation to do life with people that will disappoint you, that will probably hurt you, that will bring great delight to you, that will support you, that will forget about you. 
that will bring sturdy loyalty and will bring absolute violation of the friendship by running. You see, God has called us to the inconvenience of sustained prayer for wisdom for who we draw in to do life with that the gospel would go forward. That's pretty uncomfortable. It's deeply inconvenient. So my question to you is, do you love those snapshots of the kingdom? Do you love those snapshots of the kingdom? And will you take the most inconvenient risk of all and seek him out in copious amounts of prayer so that you know who you're called to engage? And then when you engage, prepare for the delight and the hurt. Because the engagement and walking through that means the kingdom goes forward. The kingdom on this earth for these beautiful heavenly snapshots requires his beloved to get messy. His beloved to enter into the chaos of human relationships enter into the drama of opposing viewpoints, enter into the discomfort of argument and disagreement. Whenever those relationships are sustained and sustained around the mission of Jesus Christ, guess what happens? The mission of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to participate in an inconvenient, chaotic, dramatic kingdom so that you see more and more snapshots of heaven touching earth? Lord, your, um, your word is challenging. Your interactions are challenging. The fact that you would call us into uh, this magnificent picture of the kingdom. And at the very same time, we know that that will involve heartache and hurt and delight and joy and pain because it's human. Lord, let us be unafraid of this inconvenience kingdom so that we see glimpses of heaven even before we go there. In Jesus' name, amen. Kingdom of God is inconvenient. Jesus sustains relationships with someone with an anger issue two massively different political opinions, one who would be responsible for his death, so that the gospel, the kingdom, would spread. Are you willing to live in that same inconvenience? I hope so. God bless you. We'll see you next week.